paid television organization at a conference called Digital Matters. And what will it be in one of these times? Mm -hmm. the, um, the business itself, right, TV 1.0, so to speak, the broadcast model, Chasbaugh was born when uh, Television 2.0, the pay TV model, arrived and now as we move into our third decade, it's uh, this 3.0, connected TV, digital, etc. Um, where do you see the business and the business of Casbah at this point in the game? Well, let me do the, do do the industry bit and I'll do the catch up on, on, on Casbah. You know, the first thing I might say is that a lot of people say that you know, TV is dead. One of the things that we're seeing is, look, it's going to be like the guy from you know, Star Trek says, it's TV, but not as we know it. So, so TV as we, will, as we will experience TV in the future will not be as it was 20 years ago, but will not be as it is now. And I think in, in that respect, one, one's going to have to focus very clearly on what it is that the consumer wants. I disagree with that. Um, uh, clip at the beginning, Jasper, where, where it said that the uh, consumer doesn't know what they want. I think they do, and perhaps we can discuss that. What it's going to be about is how do we deliver what people want, you know, where they want it, you know, at the time they want it, you know, in a manner that, that feels convenient to them, and that they will pay for. Uh, and I think, you know, that's going to be critical. And Casbah, which went through its rebranding, you know, six months ago, I think the fact that we are now a digital media association is indeed reflective of that change. Um, but it still, you know, will have the same basic components of great content, different methods of delivery, and hopefully, very importantly, consumers that pay. And uh, according to our uh, previous speaker, I guess we are driving uh, the advancement of human civilization. Although. I wonder why, if uh, that's the case, all the early movers in our industry have come from the porn business. <laughs> Driving the advancement of human civilization? I know you don't want to touch that. No, no, no you, 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 you didn't warn me of that, but yeah. Um, Marcel's okay. been, uh, the, the title of this, section, of this session was the State of the Nation. I guess it's the nation of Casbah, uh, of which you have uh, been in office for some 10 years now. In the true Asian tradition, not a lot of term limits applying, but uh, in essence, you've seen uh, a fair bit of evolution. Um, you've seen a, uh, a development of the, of the industry out here uh, in many exciting ways, yet by comparisons to other parts of the world, uh, Asia still does lag. Uh, it's, it does about $30 billion in overall revenue. Uh, versus America's 100 million, even though it's 50% penetrated now. Most international media companies, or uh, so re uh, a recent survey that showed that Latin America leads in profitability, Europe thereafter, and Asia still is uh, struggling. A lot of that has to do with things like regulations. Where do you see this whole thing sort of? Uh, yeah, I think regulation has been a big part of the reason why there hasn't been more growth. Uh, I think if we look at, you know, whether it's price caps, whether it's just, you know, regulators who are interfering um, rather than letting the market develop, I think regulators who have been protecting certain, certain interests, I think has also hampered the development of the industry. Um, and I do believe that there's a, a very strong correlation between level of regulation and the size of the industry. And obviously, you know, Casbar is, is, has proven that in the regulating for growth. Uh, papers that we've come out with, but there is a direct correlation between good regulation, which by the way means regulated for growth, uh, and the actual size of the industry. There are a couple of other reasons, let's not just blame the regulators, there are a couple of other reasons why the industry hasn't grown as fast. You know, one of the things that, that actually um, sets Asia apart from Latin America, at the end, at the end of the day, Latin America, there are actually less languages to deal with right, than we have here. Um, so here we have many different languages, and at the end of the day, that's all about, therefore comes back to what it is that people want. And we all know that actually people want to be entertained, generally, in their own language. They don't mind being informed in English, but when you want to be entertained, ultimately you want to be entertained in your own uh, language. I think that's, again, one of the reasons why, actually, the industry has taken longer uh, to develop because actually there's been more of a requirement to invest in local language content. Well, uh, 
We'll come back to content if we have time, but given that the uh, theme of the conference is the digital side of the business, maybe we'll tap a little bit uh, into that area. Uh, I know there's going to be a, uh, a connected TV uh, panel this afternoon uh, and a uh, millennials panel, I think, uh, on Wednesday, that's tomorrow. Um, a few years ago at the CASWA conference, we did a millennials panel, and there were four high school students, and they were all talking about the way they were consuming television uh, off their computers in the uh, cafeteria of the high school. At that point, nobody was calling it over the top, nobody was calling it cord cutting, they were just calling it millennial consumption. That was the first glimpse. Now, Asia's got uh, 210 fixed broadband population of the, the, I think it was the 3 billion that we just learned if you add mobile to it is available uh, globally. In Asia, this seems that it could either be a terrific opportunity or a intersection of technology and uh, the unauthorized distribution that we've uh, come to despise around here. Where do you view our position in that intersection? Yeah, well, first of all, I think we have to you know, we talk about broadband, but we've got to talk about the size of the pipe. And one of the things that really concerns me right now is we're getting carried away when talking about broadband connections and, and what have you. But actually, the size of the pipe is really the big constraint right now. You know, we know actually how frustrated we get when something doesn't, you know, when we try to log on and we don't log on. What worries me right now is over who pays for the pipe, right? Because that the need for that pipe to get bigger and bigger is certainly there. The question is, is who's going to pay? Um, we've obviously seen NBN here, we've seen NBN coming up in, in, uh, in Australia. You know, the question is, who's going to pay? Is that a government requirement that actually you know, governments are going to have to pay for that pipe? So that's the first thing that worries me when we start talking about broadband as if oh, it's there suddenly, but the question is, no one who pays. The issue around piracy, I think, is, is a huge problem and will remain at, you know, that's why I've been trying to fight piracy for 20 years, I think it was about signal theft, generally speaking. You know, whether it was a splitter or whatever it was, it was... Now we're just seeing piracy in a different way. Um, and it will remain a huge issue for the industry, and a huge industry, uh, a huge issue there for the um, So I think, you know, the piracy of content, the way, the way that it's happening is changing, but it's certainly, it's certainly there. But it does... In essence, then, it you know, illustrates that the demand is there and consumers will find what they want, where they want it, and I guess the new model is there for uh, the responsibilities in the, in the platform providers' court. You know, the music industry, well, the analogy I was using, if you look at the way the music industry has changed, and seeing you here, we might as well talk about it, is that the music industry for a long time forced me to buy 10 tracks when I only wanted one. Okay? And actually, was it any surprise when 10 tracks actually cost around about 10 US dollars that the, when I only wanted one, the value of the equation wasn't there? There was a lot of money for the one track I wanted. And I think what, what we've now seen is the consumer saying, I will pay for what I want, maybe. But I'm not, certainly not going to pay for what you want to force feed me. So I think the whole world is now around, what is it that I will pay for? Do I pay for content? Do I pay for an experience? Right? Why do why do people pay a lot of money to go to a gig when they rip off music? Isn't when they go to a gig, aren't they going for the music? And yet they won't pay for the music. Well, of course they, they are paying for the music, but they're paying for the bigger experience. So I think what what we all have to adapt to is how do we provide? How are we flexible enough to provide? Um, the consumer with what they want and allow them to pay for it how they would like, whether that's micropayments, whether it's subscriptions or whatever. How do we provide different, you know, basically, you know, it's an open world where you can get whatever you want, but I'll pay for it in the way I want to, not the way you're forcing me to. So in the pre-digital days of Casbah, when you had your basic cable subscription and you got the full menu, that was it versus nowadays where it's a much more a la carte experience is where you think to see things have headed. It's quite obvious. You've mentioned uh, a kind of next iteration of that in conversations we've had um, where you've referred to something called content verticals. And uh, I'm curious to hear you expand a little bit on you know, how that 
merges into the core TV business and then yeah. out. Well, it, it does. Content verticals to me I mean, you can, can be the new channels. A channel it can, can be, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about channels a bit later, but to me a content vertical is really interesting because it allows us to provide not just TV content, but other forms of not just content, but also products. So, you know, if you are, um, if you are, you know, a healthcare, you know, we know that the healthcare industry is a growing industry. It's probably one of the very few growing industries worldwide. Um, we're all worried about health. A healthcare content vertical, where you have access to information about diseases, information about protection, around treatments, but it could be around lifestyle too. It could be around spa treatments. It gives the opportunity for people to monetize that interaction with the customer in multiple different ways. Not through, not just only through TV content, um, but also through e-commerce and, and transactions. And I think the really exciting thing that we haven't yet entirely got our minds around is how we monetize transactions rather than just you know pushing content. How do we actually engage with the consumer using content at the, the heart of that and actually you know, start to get some incremental transaction revenue uh, from that. And that will obviously be shared, that won't be all out. So tie that back uh, for everyone to where that uh, comes back to the state of the nation of television. And in fact, what is television now in this third decade of Casbah's existence? Um, I, I mean, I, you know, number one is we often talk about change, and there's, there's been a lot of talk about change. Number one, let's always remember we overestimate. In, I wasn't even said this. We overestimate um, the impact of change in the short run, and underestimate in the long run. So TV today still actually has many um, characteristics of TV in the past. I mean, there's still a lot of people who would be quite happy to receive TV as we know it today. But I think the key point is, is that there is a generation out there, and you know whether you call them that generation or you know um, millennials. There are people who are saying, actually, we just want a much more sophisticated, sophisticated way of accessing content. Um, but TV, in my mind, is around high-quality video content, um, and it doesn't matter how we receive it. True. In the uh, personal experience in our house, I think there's more television consumed on, uh, on computers and, and uh, handheld devices than on actual television that uh, we heard earlier are now uh, selling a million less than they, they did last year, but so it's less about the device and, and, and more to the content. In that respect, the whole local, global discussion has been going on for years. Traditionally, people will say uh, local content is the way to go. Yet when you look at it, a lot of the driver content that runs on uh, leading local channels around the world are actually global formats. So you'll get formats that are developed in the UK and Holland and the states that then travel into to, uh, local versions. Uh, yeah, and I think the interesting thing about many of that compelling content is the degree to which the consumer is actually being part of that. If you look at, let's take Idol for a classic example, you know, it's not up to you as the producer to determine the result of Idol. The result of idle are those millions of people who vote for their winner, right? That is audience participation, that's consumer participation in determining the outcome of that. And I think one of the reasons why people get so, uh, you know, number one, it, it's great because it's live, and we all know that, that you know, the, the one time when you still have prime time is around live, um, which is why sport is so cool. But the other reason why it's so cool is because you've got this active participation. Um, and you know whether it's ringing up and voting or online voting or using you know a device at home to, to record a vote, people like that level of participation, um, and that interesting enough seems to have crossed boundaries. It, um, you know that's really travelled not just the content but the method of evolving. And um, in a digital sense, you know it occurs to me when you think digital matters, it's about functionality, it's about choice. It's about you know, the massive catchment area of content that we have. But beneath all of it, still, human creativity is what's driving what people want to consume. Uh, you know, Netflix has had to go out and cut deals for original content.
to step up and compete with the Showtimes and HBOs of the world. <clears throat> when you're out here in Asia, from your Casbah perch, and you're looking at markets with terrific creative capacity, like China, like India, like all of Asia, Singapore is doing a terrific job developing the industry here. Why is it that we have seen to such a small degree the development of content that's then traveled elsewhere around the world in the same way you see a lot of the big formats that have rolled across the planet over the last 10 years? I don't know, you tell me. I'm the one doing the interviewing, not, uh, I mean, there, I, I think some, some of it does have to do with the way, um, the way that industries um, have been regulated and that they haven't uh, converged with talents from other parts of the world because there have been some barriers to entry. That's just one thought I had, but I'm sure from your perspective you've seen, you know, a lot of reasons as well. Yeah, I, I think perhaps we have, a, I mean, I think there's a number of reasons. That, uh, I think number one is Asia has undersold itself in terms of the rest of the world um, because we have been very much focused on a local market, a local diaspora. You know, we, India has followed the Indian diaspora, but by the way, Indians outside of India aren't the same as Indians inside India. We all know that. I mean, you know, um, Slumdog Millionaire was a hit in the States, but it wasn't a hit in India. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually think that, that one answer is actually that's not where the focus has been. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is changing. In fact, I know that is changing. Um, but, but you know, a lot of the people that I've been dealt with over the years just haven't had that in their mind. So you feel maybe the, the reason is it's just these, uh, because with the, the dynamism in the growth in the local market, right. which is sizable and scalable, have been uh, taking a lot of people's books and time. They haven't actually taken it offshore. Correct. We see. I mean, some form of Korean content, I think, has traveled within Asia. Um, but generally speaking, we haven't seen a lot of it because actually the focus has been local language, local market. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen the emergence of formats here that have been used in other parts of the world. I mean, there's one or two examples, but they're you know, few and far between. Uh, it just hasn't been, you know, when I've been to people in the industry, that's not been what they've been talking about. The export market has not been the issue has been how do you get the local market. And well, I, must, I must point out and a shout out in due respect to our Japanese colleagues in the audience, probably one of the, the grand successes in this respect is of course Japanese animation which fuels so much of the uh, kids business across the region in multiple territories. So in that we have uh, a quite a successful example. But one would wonder why um, an interesting reality format or, or a quiz show of some sort wouldn't be coming out of a market like India, or China, or Southeast Asia? Well, yes. Uh, actually, one of the things that has traveled is Japanese game shows. I mean, if you look at that. That's true as well. Right, Japanese game shows travel pretty well. So I think there are, there are examples, uh, we've mentioned a couple, um, and there's no reason why, you know, given the creativity in this region, I mean, you know, why on earth should formats only come out of basically Holland and, and the UK. By the way, the US lags mm -hmm. third or fourth to buy away. Yeah, it's UK and Holland, that's where formats come from. Why? So why? I think that the, the, because there has been that focus on, and I mean, if you think of the companies, I don't want to name them, but they are absolute juggernaut machines of the creation of these mm -hmm. formats. And that's their focus. Um, and that they've done a tremendous job. Is there any reason why they shouldn't be in an Asian equivalent? No, there's no reason why not. I actually spoke to uh, uh, a person at the, uh, the new studio production company that Warner Brothers uh, acquired last year called Shed. They, are, they create formats like Football, His Wife, etc. And uh, he told me that one of the reasons why uh, the UK is so prolific in developing this is that they tap in to uh, the journalism field there, which is which is very hard-nosed, uh, very very adept bunch of storytellers, writers, and people that just have great creative chops. So when they jam, come away with things. And I, again, I wonder if there's some connectivity there to kind of more free-flowing, open forms of media and cultures that somehow need to be in place for at, at root at the roots for this kind of stuff to uh, to blossom. Over. 
Uh, there's no question that when you get back to what, you know, what lies at the heart of all of this is actually education systems. So you, you know, I would agree with that. Um, but I think you know when we've been talking, and, and I just want to pick you up on something you, we talked about cutting the cord. Um, I, I just believe that that term you know, is a strange one because there's a lot of people who've never known a cord. You know, why do we have daddy? Why do we have a telephone that sticks to the wall? How can you ever explain that? You know, in, in five years' time, I mean, it'll look stupid standing there with a telephone, you know, attached. You're holding a handset and you're attached to the wall. How dumb are we? And I think that the issue of cutting the cord isn't so much cutting the cord, it's the fact that for many people, the cord never existed in the first place. You know, the fact that we're talking about digital matters is because we didn't have digital, and now suddenly it matters. In five years' time, everyone will just think, you know, why are they so crazy talking about digital matters? Because digital is all there is. So actually, in five years' time, my guess is we'll be starting to talk about content matters again, or the consumer matters again. So we're just going through a phase of a handover, of a migration from where we were to where we will be. You know, the only question is, how long did that take? You know, the previous speaker was looking at, you know, the explosion of information. At the end of the day, you know, information is content. We need it to be sorted, we need it to be accessed, we need it to be branded, and we need to pay for it. And you'll still come back to the same basic fundamentals. So we're only talking about digital matters because it didn't five years ago, and in five years' time, that's all there'll be. Although during that five years' time, and in just a couple of minutes that we have left to wrap, it does seem there is a fair bit of room for the traditional TV business still to run. And in that respect, it's yeah. quite an exciting time for the business because there's dual track that it's going to be operating on, both on very steep growth trajectories. And that's what's so cool about the Asian industry, right? Because we have loads of room to grow in, in what was relatively a traditional business. We have huge opportunity to interact with new types of content and new forms of delivery. And so we have both going for us. Um, and, and that, I think, is why the Asian growth story is still very cool. I do wish the regulators would kind of, you know, get to grips with what is going on. You know, we've got to have a lot more neutrality in terms of regulation. It is ridiculous. The consumer cannot understand why content, which is the same bit of content, is regulated in different ways on different, because they're receiving it in different ways. Uh, they just can't understand that. And uh, I think it's very interesting watching what's going on in the UK at the moment around, you know, a certain footballer and his mistress. Have you been following this? So that uh, I'm sure many of you know about this. There, uh, there was uh, a footballer who has an affair. Now, I've been following a certain IMF uh, head in his I chambermaid. I, pref I prefer the footballer who must be remain nameless, except not on Twitter, um, has issued a gag order against the sort of traditional media saying, you can't talk about my affair with Imogen Thomas um, for a Big Brother star. And yet, on Twitter, of course, the name of the footballer um, has been released. Now, the question is, is, how do you have, you know, so there is a new media format which the law hasn't got to grips with. And the interesting thing is, and the reason why I use that as an example, because we see that in all types of regulation. Why should something not be, why should dear old television be so regulated when the same content is available online, unregulated? That is fundamentally unfair to the TV industry, and that needs to be addressed. Uh, and unless that is addressed, then that is one of the reasons why actually uh, TV won't grow as fast as perhaps it should. Okay, more so. As uh, they say on one of our networks, CNN, we will have to leave it at that. I uh, don't want to wrap, however, before uh, thanking you on behalf of uh, all of our colleagues at JASBA for the 10 years of service that you've done. Uh, inform, represent, and connect is the motto. You have informed us, you've represented JASBA, and uh, you've connected us all to the new uh, wave of uh, digital mattering. Thank you very much, Marcel Finesse, ladies and gentlemen, Chairman of Thank you.